it's setting up for a massive silver squeeze. And maybe, just maybe, this is why you have these four big cartel bullion banks who are notoriously known to be short coming over with hat in hand in the Shanghai Metals Exchange four weeks in a row. Maybe that's what this is talking about. The bottom line is, to me, silver represents um, the, the, the best most undervalued opportunity asset I've ever seen. It's like, it's almost as if gold and silver markets seem to be playing by a new set of rules, I guess is what I would try to say. And um, it's almost as if commodities like Zoltan Pozar said, this is Bretton Woods three, a system surrounded by commodities. It's as if commodities are worth more than currency nowadays, and this is a rush to do so. If you look at gold since 2000, as an example, it's massively outperformed the bond market, but what it has is that it, it has no counterparty risk. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, the CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And uh, we have Andy Schachtman joining us. He's the president over at Miles Franklin. He's a returning guest, of course. If you've been following this channel, you've seen Andy on here a number of times. But uh, we haven't talked in about four months, and it's time to catch up. And uh, we are here at the end of May, early June. Oh, early June, sorry. June 5th already. I got to get my dates in order. And uh, we got to catch up on financial policies, monetary policies, geopolitics and of course the massive moves in gold and silver prices uh, over the recent months like what triggered it and uh, where's the price discovery happening these days so lots to talk about but before i switch over to my guest hit that subscribe button hit that like button leave a comment during the conversation are we asking the right questions are your ask questions getting answered let us know we do want to hear from you now without much further ado andy welcome back on the program it's good to see you again my friend Hi, my man it's always great to see you brother it uh I think it's been it's been at least that long. I think last time I saw you was uh, wasn't it in Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, end of end of January. We yeah. sat down together I'm in person. On, man, it goes fast. It's unbelievable. It's like just seems these days times moving faster than normal. But uh, good to see you. Look forward to seeing you at Rick's conference here in a few weeks in Boca and. Uh, but I'm glad to be back. Appreciate the invite very much. Oh, absolutely. Really looking forward to this chat, Andy. As I said before, before we hit the record button, we have so much to talk about. And uh, right maybe we'll start a bit uh, on the policy side. Uh, let's talk financial and uh, monetary policy. Since January, has anything changed? It doesn't feel like it. It seems like status quo is prevailing. Well, I mean, I mean, the only thing that sticks out to me is the realization in terms of monetary policy and fiscal irresponsibility that we are creating a trillion dollars of debt every hundred days, you know, and and when you talk about just how big that is, well, it took almost two hundred years to to accumulate the first trillion dollars, trillion seconds ago, is thirty one thousand six hundred eighty eight years ago, and when you talk about you know the ability to continue to create that much debt in an environment where you know um, you could argue our policies are not really um, really being embraced around the globe. Uh, I think it's, it's for me, that's really what stands out from a monetary policy is just the ever increasing amount of debt creation of spending irresponsible, uh, fiscal policy to me, that's really the, what I see on a macro perspective. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of periphery out there that can, that can distract, but just looking at, the amount of of um, spending coming out of uh, out of the government or the number of auctions, you know, we we just had seventy billion dollars in five year U.S. Treasury and seventy billion in two year U.S. Treasury notes, and and that you know you got two hundred and forty four billion in Treasury debt on top of that that's hitting just hitting now uh, the market, and so when you talk about monetary and fiscal policy, to me it's just about irresponsibility massive money creation and um i i don't think it ends well this is not something that that i think is uh is a recipe for success moving forward yeah do you think the pressure or like sentiment has increased meaning like it feels like when we last spoke there was more nervousness around the system uh we were talking maybe potential rate cuts like uh, powell just to, if, maybe four or five weeks ago before we last spoke was extremely dovish and uh, hinted at maybe three 
rate cuts. Now we're still sitting pretty. We haven't moved at all. Um, September might be the earliest the market predicts now a rate cut. At the time we spoke, the market predicted like six to seven cuts. Um, it seems like the the nervousness is out of the system a little bit and uh, everything's Goldilocks, right? You keep coming back to that term. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Nobody's really worried. Recession fears are waning. Like, Where do you stand on that? Like, where, Where's sentiment in general? Yeah, I don't think that. I mean, I've been saying all along, I don't think that they're going to cut. Um, you know, it's 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 one of these deals where if they cut, inflation is going to roar. And everything they've told us it has been the opposite of what they've told us. Go all the way back to, well, there is no inflation and then it's transitory, whatever the hell that means. And then it's structural, but then it's under control. But then it's reared its head again. We're going to do four rate cuts for sure. <clears throat> Maybe two. And now you're even hearing guys like the uh, the head of the Minneapolis Fed saying maybe we're even going to raise rates. Uh, I don't think you can believe anything that comes out of the Federal Reserve's mouth collectively. Uh, and I don't see them cutting rates. I think it's higher for longer. I mean, look, when you talk about inflation, when you talk about commitments, look, everyone talks about the 34, nearly $35 trillion debt, but that takes doesn't take into account, Kai, the unfunded liabilities of Medicare Part B, $99 trillion. Medicare Part D, the prescriptions, uh, $22 trillion. Social Security, $77 trillion. Government military pensions. Who the hell is going to pay for that? How about the 15 to 17 million people, depending upon which person you listen to in terms of unofficial number of people entering this country illegally? Who's going to pay for their schooling, their food, their housing, their, their, you know, their medical the the amount of commitments that we have are extraordinary. So when you talk about reigniting the inflation engine, I mean, it's already here. It's ignited. The amount of money that's been created in the past several years is, is extreme, hasn't even worked its way through the system yet. So if we do cut, to me, what it really signals to the rest of the world is we've given up on austerity. We've given up on normalizing our balance sheet ever. And if we do cut, I think you can just look for massive, massive uh, reigniting of, of inflation that becomes far more apparent than it already is by the lying CPI numbers where they exclude things like coffee, which is up 80% in the last year. Oh, let's pull it out and replace it with tea. The, the way that they lie to us about what inflation really is, is bad enough. But I think that that cutting is a problem where you're going to have to wonder who the hell is going to be foolish enough to buy our treasuries. And these large amount of treasuries, a, a trillion dollars worth every quarter to finance our, our addiction to spending, who's going to take it when we start to lower rates? I don't think that they can lower rates. I think that they are stuck. And um, usually if you just do the opposite of what they tell you, it pretty much works out to to, to the truth and then go back and look, go all the way back to Bernanke saying the subprime crisis is contained and a few weeks later it blows up. They're not being honest with us. They're not honest with us about any of the numbers that come out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, nor are they honest with us about their projections of rate cuts. I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest with you. Higher for longer? Yeah, I think that's here to stay. Yeah, I, I tend to agree here because all the economic indicators that we're getting true or not like if you look at the numbers there, there's no reason to cut in my opinion yet like yes we do see higher inflation on a how would you would call it on a personal level right but uh like they, they have to rely on that data it's not like they go to the grocery store and check uh, what, what a banana or something costs and to uh, you know make policy according to that that benchmark right um i'm, I'm just looking at the gdp growth for the us 1.3 percent the last quarter here in, in 2024 uh, way below what we've seen previous in previous quarters. Uh, any any most of it growth is, expectations? Is, like most of it is created out of the government. You take the government creation out of there. The you know the job creation and 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 the GDP created by the government. I mean, what is it really? You know, I think that it's it's a joke. Most of the lie, most of the numbers that we see, I don't believe one bit at all. And um, you know, I think people feel like we're being told everything's okay and a soft landing is 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 at hand. Yet, you know, you take a look at what's happening uh, around you. You got 65% of the country living paycheck to paycheck. 45% of the people uh, that uh, are making over 100 grand a year, over six figures, they're living paycheck to paycheck. So yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's as rosy as 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 people are telling us. And, and you look at what's going on with, 
with the banks and with the commercial real estate and with the economy in general, I don't think the numbers that we are being given and the information we are being given lines up with Main Street. Uh, I think people are hurting right now and half the country can't even afford a McDonald's. So I, you know, it's, I, I just think really, Kai, if there's a major theme here, it's the numbers that we are being told are crap. And, and everyone points to this strength in the, in the equity markets being held up by a handful of stocks. But in reality, to me, what this is, is um, smoke and mirrors. And, and, and I think people feel that the numbers that we are being reported really just aren't indicative of how easy it is to make ends meet these days. Yeah, I agree with reality and to, where is it? Facts don't don't match anymore, right? Yeah. So absolutely. I, I tend to agree there. Um, we, we talked about rate cuts real quick. Canada, not a major, you know, country per se, but it's part of the G7, expected to cut actually during our conversation here. The ECB later this week, uh, as we're recording, is, is expected to cut as well. Is that sort of the, a trend change? Like, is is that the, the beginning? Is the Will the U.S. be forced to potentially cut just to, to you know, stay suit? And especially with the ECB, isn't there a bit of a, it's called a currency war between the U.S. dollar and the euro when, when that happens? Yeah, you could argue, and, and maybe this is why you see the central banks buying gold at record levels that they've never seen before. I mean, it just seems that all of these countries are trapped and um, damned if you do and damned if you don't. A currency war is indeed, yeah, and um, you race to the bottom. Well, that's not a recipe for success. That's not not a currency you want to be hanging on to. And but it's, it, it becomes a bigger problem when you talk about the U.S. bond market. If everyone is racing to the bottom and, and cutting, what does that say for the ever, you know, the ever increasing debt burden that we have? Look, the national debt right now is $34.7 trillion here in the U.S. And if you, you know, I just read a statistic that says if you laid that money, uh, that many dollar bills end to end, it would wrap around the earth 134,599 times. That's enough to travel the sun and back 17 times. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. How how do we continue to finance our debt by cutting rates when the world realizes that we have chosen inflation over austerity? And that's really the, the problem. It, when you see all of these countries shedding, if you look at a graph of China and their their treasury holdings versus their gold accumulation it, it's like this they're dumping treasuries as fast as they can to not cut off their nose to spite your face and i would argue this is part of the reason that rates are continuing to stay elevated is that a lot of these countries are selling debt and you look at the countries that we are supposed to believe are now leading the accumulation of our treasuries you got ireland you got the uk uh, you got the cayman islands i mean i got a bridge to sell you if you believe that's true Guys like Jim Willie have the courage to come out and say that he believes and and has you know heard from his sources that you know, the Federal Reserve is is paying money under the table of these countries to continue to support you know and of course with the carry trade unwinding there's a lot of things going on right now that I think if you cut uh, you signal um, you, you really signal that you're waving the white flag and I think that only accelerates the the uh, the cohesion and the the rapid growth of you know the organizations like the BRICS and the continued de-dollarization and de-treasurization, which I really do believe is being replaced right now with gold. And if you look at gold since 2000 as an example, it's massively outperformed the bond market. But what it has is that it it has no counterparty risk. And when we go around the world imposing sanctions and now have the nerve to actually steal the russian assets to use it to fund the, the the ukraine war and you got the you know the the european union talking about seizing which we already have they have the 290 billion or 80 billion in russian reserves now they haven't talked about actually taking that money as much as they have taking the interest generated from it and using it to fund the ukraine war collectively the west has lost its mind and i think when you talk about cutting rates it will only add fuel uh, to you know, to the cohesion and to the to the rallying cry to move away from the West. I think it would be as foolish as can be. But when you look at all of the stupid things that have been done by the West collectively in terms of uh, of geopolitically, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. In fact, the the title of my first talk at at Rick's conference is uh, "Is this all too foolish to not be planned?" You look around, you say, "My God, what are they doing?" So the people leading the the you know the people pulling the strings um, 
to me, are, are making all of the wrong decisions. So I guess we'll have to see how it all plays out. But yeah, I just can't see them. I can't see cutting being a constructive um, course of action and think it only accelerates the demise of 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 the system and and the de-dollarization and the de-treasurization will only increase uh, exponentially if we continue to go down that road. Yeah. No, well, Chinese treasury holdings uh, have dropped to like a low we haven't seen since 2009. And then uh, you, you brought up the carry trade, which is interesting because Japanese have been buying U.S. treasuries like there's no tomorrow because right. they're, they're borrowing a negative interest. So they're, and, and they're buying at 4%, 4.5% or even 5% if they buy the two-year. Well, don't right? think that Wall Street's not taking part in that too. I mean, this has been a cash cow for a very long time. But, you know, this is a, a system that is, um, I think you could argue, getting close to to the end game in terms of this Western system. And I think Zoltan Pozar said it best. And honestly, I truly do. You know, he said we are in Bretton Woods 3. Bretton Woods 1 was when we took over for the pound sterling. Bretton Woods 2, loosely when we became the petrodollar. Now, I'm not saying that this is true, by the way, but there are people out there like John Little uh, from uh, has a substack called Pickaxe. He's done some amazing research on the military-industrial complex. But he's claiming that in just a couple of days here on the 9th, that the Saudis have already informed the West that they will no longer honor the 50-year agreement that was signed 50 years ago on the 9th by, you know, the Saudis. And um, uh, what was his name? Can't believe I'm not thinking of it right now. Um, uh, Kissinger. So I don't know that to be true, but I'll simply tell you this, that, uh, you know, the, the, crown, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia recently said China was our most important trading partner this year and for the next 50 those words might have been chosen more carefully than we can all imagine. But, you know, yeah, these are interesting times we live in, Kai, and I think will only get more interesting. That, by the way, is a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Yeah, I know you, you brought up geopolitics, and I think we need to stay on that topic because it is getting hotter out there. I don't know, for lack of a better term, like it is getting more t oh, tense. Tense is a good word. Let's, let's go with tense. Because um, Putin and Xi met on May 16th. They met in China, and uh, quite a bit has happened since. China did a military exercise blocking uh, or pretending to block Taiwan. Uh, Russia has had a couple aggressive attacks on the Ukraine. Uh, I spoke with Simon Hunt just earlier this week, and he talked about that Russia is actually preparing a strike against the NATO member country, um, which could happen fairly soon. So it is getting, uh, what do you call it? It's like it, it tends here out there. Yeah, for lack of a better term. Geopolitics, we have to pay attention to. And uh, Putin and Xi cast the U.S. as the new Cold War supreme leader, the U.S. Uh, you know Cold War hegemon here, and uh, talk, talk a bit about that rift that we're seeing here, and uh, where, where is it showing? Like, where are you tracking, and how are you tracking it? Look, you know, I think you cross the line when, as the world reserve currency, you confiscate assets of another country. That's not for us to decide, and you could argue the the the, the provocation is more on our side by weaponizing and stealing the assets of the Russians, by by speaking of bringing NATO troops onto the front line now, you're hearing ru rumors of that, by putting you know NATO troops in the Ukraine, by, by talking with Finland and Sweden about joining NATO. We are provoking by providing weaponry, by providing money, by, by providing um, you know, intelligence. You could argue we're, we're, we're certainly provoking i think the world looks at us as being completely hypocritical you know and 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 i think there's no better way to describe that than to see what's happened for example in in iraq where we invent invaded their country 20 years ago and we're still there we went there under the guise of weapons of mass destruction hey sorry we didn't find them but here we are 20 years later we're still here we've sanctioned 14 of their banks for having the audacity of trying to buy liquid natural gas through iranian banks um and they made $90 billion in oil revenue last year, and they asked us for a billion dollars towards the end of last year, and we said, sorry, it's not a good time. Check back later. So what have they done? They formally applied to BRICS. They've kicked, they're in the process of kicking Western coalition forces out of the country. They've made trading in dollars illegal. You'll go to prison if you do, and, and they'll take your business if you have a business. Um, and as of January 1st, there are no green bills in any denomination in any of the banks in Iraq. Or Janet Yellen can say that to CNBC last week or two weeks ago, listen, we're okay, China, with you being friends with Russia. And my initial reaction hearing that was, well, thank you so much, Madam Secretary. That's wonderful of you. But if you give one penny 
to the Russian war machine, we will sanction your, your banks, your businesses, and Beijing itself. Never mind that we've given $200 billion with little, if none, no congressional oversight to the Ukraine. We're the world reserve currency. We can do these things. The, the poking, the, the, the prodding, um, it, it's, I think it's, it's ridiculous. And, and going around and pointing fingers, uh, I think, is ridiculous. I think much of the Southern Hemisphere and a good portion of the world looks at us as being the ones that are meddling and being involved and doing things that we shouldn't be doing. So I, you know what, look, I'm a patriot. This country has done a lot for me, but I think, and I thank God every day I was born here, but I think our leaders are 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 embarking upon a disastrous course, one that is, you know, unfortunately leading towards perhaps World War III. And when you talk about bringing American soldiers, uh, and if you look, you know, they're talking about what would happen if, if Russia were to be more aggressive in an invasion towards Europe, you know, because we, they told us, you put, you put uh, NATO in these countries surrounding me, there's going to be problems. Now they're talking about a NATO, you know, invasion force and where they would land and, and largely American troops. I mean, we're, we're out, they're out of our mind. We're telling them they can use American-made military uh, weaponry to fire into Russia now. I mean, at what point does it just seem that we're not involved? This is a proxy war. And I think it's very hypocritical to cast stones at Putin um, because quite frankly, um, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that it's, there's a lot of blame to go around. hundred percent. And I do agree with you. And uh, one topic that really fits the docket here is uh, the BRICS nations gaining more members. Uh, I think there are seven members that want to join BRICS just this year alone, uh, bringing the total, I believe to, Oh God. Uh, now I went too far to my depth. I think it's 13 then. Um, but it might, might be 14. Um, well, Venezuela actually, is one of them. 10 members right now. Is it 10? Then it's 17. Okay, so apologies. Yeah, and, and, and 36 have formally applied. Now, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and it's hard to, to discern which is the right one. But there's been 36 that have formally applied, seven that are really on the cusp. We'll see how many that they, they bring into the fold. But, yeah, it, it's a growing group for sure. Yeah, it's like I picked up Venezuela because I saw a headline the other day, which stuck with me. I just found it again. Uh, it's a Reuters headline, but up to 50 firms seek U.S. oil licenses in Venezuela. That headline itself sounds like it's wrong. <laughs> like, how can you? How can the U.S. distribute oil licenses in Venezuela? So, I think that could be a really interesting hotbed. And that's where I was just thinking out loud, maybe, and uh, haven't thought this one through. But uh, oil has always been a hot topic uh, in, in in the U.S.'s history. Uh, do, you, do you see potential conflict here? If they join BRICS, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you know, they're, they have, by people estimate, they have the largest untapped oil reserves in the world. Um, and I think they will. Uh, these, are, these countries are, are choosing sides. And I think that, that you will see countries like Venezuela uh, join BRICS. Turkey just admitted that they want to, to join BRICS. Turkey is a NATO member. And, when, and they're talking about using Turkey to to have as a as a jump off point for if they had to get involved in the war where they would actually use Turkey as, as their airstrips and whatnot. Now they want to join the BRICS. What does all of this really mean? Um, look, I think if you look at the the what's happening with the BRICS, it's legitimate and it's hard to delegitimize it. You already have a larger swath of of human population, a larger percentage of global GDP, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet, more a larger swath of, of, of rare earth metals in the Eurasian continent and gold and silver and all of these commodities that, that are uh, part of what you would need to build a real economy and, and not opaque debt promises from an insolvent government uh, and if you believe what Zoltan Pozar said, look at all the countries that they bring into the fold. These are countries that are massively resource rich and or have very strategic shipping lanes. And, you know, I think this is a trend that will only continue. You add into it the Belt Road Initiative, which is we've talked about before, the largest infrastructure project in human history, which is many of the same countries, including all of the OPEC countries, and you start to get into 85 to 90 percent of human population. Add into it the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. I've been saying for years that they will join. Uh, Jim Rickards has said that. And now you got the president of Belarus calling for a summit to bring these two com these two organizations into the BRICS. You know the the SCO who Saudi Arabia joined as well. So did Iran. 
is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet. These, these, these countries are finding safety in numbers, and I think it's just beginning. And that's the thing about the BRICS is that they've done things very methodically. People think this is something that just happened. You're going on 18 years that this has been going on, but it, the, the acceleration, their coordination, their sophistication is growing, accelerating. And um, I guess we'll see how it all plays out in the big meeting in October. But, um, you know, I, I think that this is something not to take lightly by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. No, I really like these discussions, Andy, because uh, a lot evolves and revolves around geopolitics. And uh, I think gold and silver, uh, our next topic here, is a, is a direct correlation to geopolitics. You mentioned central banks buying gold, for example. We have to talk about the, the move in gold. And I perceived it as a violent move in gold um, since our conversation from about you know 1900 or even 1750, if you want to go that low, to over $2,400. We're trading around, what is it, uh, as we speak, I think 2330 yeah 2334 as we're speaking here Andy, it's it's a violent move higher we, we got to talk quickly about the triggers and to what is holding gold up right now well i mean the the conventional wisdom is the central bank purchasing that's what everyone's talking about uh that the central banks are buying at levels never seen before in the last three years uh, you look at a country like india as an example the Reserve Bank of India just purchased 24 tons of gold in the first four months of, of this year, the first quarter plus, which is one and a half times what they bought all of last year in 2023. We're seeing some very interesting things as well, um, you know, in terms of the exchanges being bled down. And, and you look at, for example, what's happening right now off of Comex just recently, uh, three Fridays ago, we saw 7,560 kilo bars shipped out of, of the COMEX to Brinks, Hong Kong. Brinks, Hong Kong is a COMEX depository. And the conventional wisdom is that nothing goes to Brinks, Hong Kong that isn't what's called exchange for physical, where, you know, these, these traders can buy in the West and deliver in the East now, China is paying a offering a very nice arbitrage opportunity for the traders who have the ability to access both markets. It's about four bucks an ounce in silver, not so acute in gold. But ask yourself this question Who the hell's got $571 million to purchase uh, 243,000 ounces delivered off of COMEX to Brinks Hong Kong? And the, and the belief is, is that they are then trucked over because these are all kilo bars. And, and the Shanghai exchange deals in kilo bars. The mini contract on COMEX is kilo bars. So someone, some entity, and some people think it's HSBC Bank. I don't know who it is, but I can tell you that $571 million worth of kilo bars were delivered to Brinks Hong Kong. Some people believe it's then being trucked to the Shanghai exchange, which uses kilo bars. And when you talk about the amount of, of central bank purchasing, it's off the charts. Um, and I don't think we're even being told how much these central banks are buying. But when you realize that not only are these banks accumulating gold, it is a trend of repatriation as well. And, you know, the, re the Bank of India just moved 100 tons of gold quietly out of the Bank of England and took possession of it. And, and you go back a few years, you start with the Bundesbank in Germany, the Dutch National Bank, uh, the, the Bank of Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland. We just saw the Bank of Saudi Arabia, all uh, several um, African banks and a couple more Middle Eastern banks all pull their gold out of the Bank of England and the New York Fed. So it's, a, it's, it's about slow repatriation. It's about slow accumulation. Not too fast to raise attention. But what I really do believe is happening is that the Western suppression of metals, as foolish as it is, which has originally been there to to suppress the demand for gold in a low interest rate environment, which is obviously changing, um, they're using that suppression, uh, the, the large short positions of the commercial banks, to drain the exchanges, to do exchange for physical, to drain the COMEX, to drain the LBMA, and now even pulling metal out of the Shanghai exchange, uh, because I think counterparty risk is something that is very acute. And the belief that you know, um, wealth is found in, in a broke country's debt, uh, our treasuries, or, or a country that has chosen to inflate versus uh, being prudent with, with their, their fiscal policy and the monetary policies. 
Uh, I think we are moving to a period of time where the rules are being changed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's like, it's almost as if gold and silver markets seem to be playing by a new set of rules, I guess is what I would try to say. And um, it's almost as if commodities, like Zoltan Pozar said, this is Bretton Woods 3, a system surrounded by commodities. It's as if commodities are worth more than currency nowadays, and this is a rush to do so but not so fast that it creates attention. And this is how they suppress the paper price and then deliver it. Take possession of $571 million with the kilo bars in China when no one's looking off of the COMEX. This is a trend that I think you will see accelerate. And, um, you know, it's, it's the central banks largely. The big money who has not just the big money, but it's closest to the information. And, and it's interesting to me that this is being overlooked, this transition of, of gold and silver from west to east is a phenomenon that's real, and I think it's it's interesting to me just how under uh, the underestimation of the significance of this in the West to me is is, is shocking. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. To just to, on on that note, like, why is the West not acting on that? Like, why is the the West not beefing up reserves? I think Poland and Ireland are the only Western countries, top of my head, that actually have bought, uh, bought gold recently, bullion recently. So, question is like, why are we sleep here? It doesn't make any sense, to be honest with you. Um, you know, who knows what our real gold reserves are? Who knows where the 12 billion in gold reserves that the Ukraine supposedly sold to fund the war went? Who knows where Saddam Hussein's gold went or Gaddafi's gold went? You know, I don't know. It's 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 actually, I find it to be quite foolish um, that the Eastern countries are so open about their gold accumulation. And, you know, but but it's not true how much they're accumulating. You got analysts from the Bank of Montreal. You got even people, I think, in the IMF who came out and said the numbers that that we see are nowhere near what is actually being accumulated. And you know, China is the largest producer of gold in the world, too. They're not telling us how much they're producing. We have no idea how much they're really, truly accumulating. But I think it's very foolish. I think it's hubris. I think it's recency bias, normalcy bias. Um, I think the West is, is um, if they really aren't accumulating any, they're asleep at the switch. This is a system where, look, if you look at a historical footprint, accepting treasury debt, the debt of another country has a very small footprint in terms of being historically significant. And I think we're moving away from that. And when you weaponize the treasury uh, and make it so that if we don't align ideologically, we're going to take it from you, only as incentivizing and accelerating the detreasurization, the de-dollarization, and the accumulation of gold, which has no counterparty risk. And this is the whole thing here. It's an asset not only that has outperformed the bond market going back to 2000 handily, but it's an asset that carries, as Doug Casey has made famous his statement, an asset that simultaneously carries no counterparty liability. And it's true. And I think that's really what the world is realizing, that uh, if, as Rick Rule says, you're not a contrarian, you're destined to be a victim. And, and if you're fully invested in dollars, you're destined to go broke. Well, that's the same thing that I think the central banks see and are acting upon. And the truth of it is, is that our media doesn't do a poor job of telling us this. They do no job of telling us <laughs> this. And, and there are a lot of very sophisticated people in finance that are very well read. They just read the wrong stuff. They should be listening to you and and maybe they would have a better understanding of what is actually happening but the flow of of gold and silver this this decades long standing trend of of the price of gold and silver being determined by the western institutional investors it's breaking down and again i think the underestimating of the significance of this is a big big mistake um and I think it will one that will will wake up one morning. The West will wake up and say, "What did we just allow happen?" The prime example of it is the arbitrage on silver. You know, you have a four dollar increase on the Shanghai Metals Exchange over Comex, real damn near four dollars an ounce higher. So the arbitrage is real. Any any metal that can be purchased in the West and delivered to the East will happen at that level. Uh, and I think it should be the opposite of that. We should be hanging on and accumulating whatever we can. Instead, we're sending it all that way. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting tool. Like you, I, you, you mentioned open about gold accumulation. I think it's an interesting 
what do you call it? It's just like an interesting dagger or like knife to use like on, on the policy front. It's like by openly bragging that we're repatriating a lot of gold. Because one thing we've talked on this channel like in a couple of years ago is like, oh, what happens when gold is over 2000? What does the economy look like? What does the US uh, you know, monetary situation look like when it comes to that level? And to he here we are at, tw let's just say, $2,400. What, what does it look like? Is the world in shambles? We're, we're darn near close to it, it feels like. Well, you could also argue that, you know, gold hasn't even gone any higher. It's the fact that the dollar is losing its value. The amount of money creation and inflation is is destabilizing the value of, of everything, really, in valued in dollars. And uh, I just think people underestimate where gold will truly go um, and what that means for the dollar. So, yeah, be careful what you wish for. $2,400 on an inflation-adjusted value is still very, very low as to where it should be. Look at all of the distortions created in in over the last twenty years in in asset prices due to, you know, suppressed interest rates and 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 easy money and and you know a couple of the only assets that haven't been distorted to the upside have been gold and silver. You know, look at look at the Dow Jones, look at the Nasdaq, look at the S and P, look at all of all of these. You know, look at real estate market, look at the bond. All of these things have been distorted. Everything through suppression of interest rates. And that's the problem, the misallocations in resource and capital, the, the distortions in, in asset prices, price discovery. These things have all been distorted, yet you look at gold and silver and ask yourself, why the hell would there be four or five commercial banks that hold the largest short position in any commodity traded on the COMEX in silver? Now, there's a lot of talk going on right now about what is really happening with silver. Um, but ask yourself, why the hell would they be short? Uh, to me, it's as dumb as a mud wall. And so when, when you look at real value, um, you could argue that the, the you know, gold and silver are massively undervalued in comparison to things like the Dow Jones and, and the S&P and, uh, and the handful of stocks holding it up. So I guess it's in the eyes of the beholder. But to me, even at gold at 2,400, it's undervalued as to where it really truly should be. And um, I think people's idea of valuation are, are misplaced. Again, I will point to the fact that gold and silver are assets that have no counterparty liability. And the West has proven how dangerous it can be in holding traditional assets. They can be inflated upon, they can be defaulted upon, uh, and, and they can be confiscated if, if, if we don't align ideologically. That is, that's like sticking a knife into the heart of, of, our, uh, of this country's trust globally. And you take a glass and throw it against the wall and break it into a million pieces. Putting that back together is not easy, if not impossible. And I think we've we've come damn near close to destroying our trust. And now if you talk about lowering rates and giving up on austerity, giving up on normalizing, I mean, we never will. We got 200 trillion, literally, in debt, both funded and unfunded. How how do you ever normalize? I guess you probably won't, and we will do what all governments have done, and that's to choose inflation over austerity. But it's not going to end well. And, and this is the whole reason why the central banks, who not only are the wealthiest, but they're the most well-informed traders in the world, and they continue to buy gold because they see the handwriting on the wall, while the people in the West believe this could never happen to us, and, and that's the fatal flaw in, in all of this. 100%, Andy. I'm, I'm definitely with you there. But you opened the can of worms here for silver, and that was my last topic I want to talk to you about. $30 silver was an extremely important wall, right? We broke through it, but we fell back down again. Let's talk about this $30, the significance of $30. And uh, of course, the silver and supply demand fundamentals in the background. You have a really good, like really good insights there. And I want to pick your brain on that. Like, what, what does it look like? And you hinted at something just in your previous answer, that there's something at play in the silver market. I'm curious what that is. Yeah, you know, it, it's very interesting. Um, you take a look at the LBMA, they'll tell you they have the first or second lowest amount of silver um, held on, uh, on, on the London Bullion Market Association's platform in 140-year history. You look at the amount of silver that's been bled out of COMEX, it's massive. And it's interesting that when you talk about the Shanghai Metals Exchange, they can, you can't, export gold out of out of china unless you first take one of your bars and deposit it in the shanghai free trade zone or the shanghai metal exchange then you can export it but you can't really in general export gold but you can export silver and there's been all this talk 
recently of these traders showing up at um at, at the at the london metals exchange the the big bullion banks right and it, it's really interesting so i i started doing a little bit of digging on my own and and i found out that uh let me see if i can find the name the actual dates here give me one second hang on here just a moment because four bullion banks showed up in at the Shanghai Metals Exchange in for four straight weeks, second week of March. And if you look at first, at first it was uh, the uh, Deutsche Bank, then HSBC Bank, then JP Morgan, then Standard Charter. Going back to the second week of March, and if you realize that silver can be exported out of China, but gold cannot, look at the Shanghai Metal Exchange um, uh, silver numbers since the second week of March, and they're going straight down like this. And I have to wonder if there's a coincidence. You go right to their website and you can see that these banks showed up. They're taking pictures of it. Why are the banks showing up in Shanghai, the banks that are largely short on COMEX and the LBMA? I'm going to talk about how short they are in a moment. But why are they showing up? And then all of a sudden, the silver inventories in Shanghai start to drop. Does it mean that they're caught? Are they trapped? And, and when I say that, look, you know, as I mentioned, India has imported over 500 million ounces of silver in the last two and a half years. COMEX only has about 60 million ounces in the registered category, backing the bar. So you're talking nine times as much has been imported by India in the last two and a half years as COMEX has, period. And yet it is estimated that the contracts in the registered category are rehypothecated or resold at 1,600% or more. So 16 people hold the same contract. Good luck trying to stand for delivery. When you talk about the LBMA, that's a whole different animal all to itself. And, and you have basically all the big bullion banks at the LBMA, right? And so the LBMA tells us that they have 800 million ounces of silver in, 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 on their platform, of which 500 million belongs to the ETFs. So that leaves 300 million ounces. So between the registered category on COMEX and the 300 million ounces there, you know, you got... 340 million ounces. And you could even throw some of the register or the eligible category on COMEX into the mix. So say they got 400 million ounces, whatever that is. The LBMA right now is trading, at least what they tell us, 292 million ounces of silver per day, right? But it's interesting when you realize that they've admitted that, and, and so have the bullion banks, uh, largely in a survey that was done, I don't know how many years ago, that polled the the bullion banks that actually that actually the numbers the settlement numbers that um the lbma talks about is actually 10 times the volume they say because basically what happens is if i sell you 10 contracts and i buy five the net result is plus five they'll only count the five not the 15. so if you realize that the lbma admits that they're they're actually trading 10 times more than they're posting that would mean they're trading 2 billion 900 million ounces of silver per day or three and a half times the global mine production per day now when you realize they're at their lowest level ever and the comex has bled down what the hell are these four banks showing up for in shanghai if you can't export gold but you can export silver does that mean they're trapped they went there and asking for some help a little quid pro quo look at the, the 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 numbers on shanghai they're falling since the first day they showed up there and what i'm basically getting at is that permitting all of these paper claims to be created on the same amount of silver has allowed the pace of silver to be managed and i think they're trapped i really truly do believe that they are trapped and shanghai's not making it easy for them Four dollar premium on on the Shanghai Metals Exchange. It started at two, then two and a half, then three, then three and a half, and now we're damn near four bucks. They are incentivizing all of the silver that can be sent east. They're incentivizing. Now they are giving up some to the west, but what did they have to do? It looks it appears that way. What did they have to give up to do that? What what are they getting to do that? Rather, what did the west have to give up to do that? And I think that that the bottom line here is that these banks are naked short massive amounts of silver. And I think they're realizing that it's becoming harder and harder to get silver and being naked short to that degree, millions and millions and millions of ounces is detrimental. I will ask everyone to go back and, and listen to Chris Marcus's podcast, uh, Arcadia Economics with Bart Chilton. 
where Bart Chilton admits all of this stuff happened with Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan, says that this all happened first time ever. He admits it publicly, and then he dies a week or two later. Now, I'm not saying there's a correlation there, but I'm simply saying it, it's, it's vindication for all us people who say this stuff happens. The head of the former CFTC, or the former head of the CFTC, Bart Chilton, admits this stuff is happening. And what I'm basically implying here is that I think the West, I hate to use the word silver squeeze, but that's almost as if what it appears is happening. When you have countries like India and China massively accumulating silver, where the rumors are China's telling its populace to start to buy silver, where India is buying it hand over fist, and the amount of available silver for delivery is, is way, way, way under what the the um, completely and totally rehypothecated LBMA and COMEX have sold, uh, where, which are you know, promises to deliver, um, it's setting up for a massive silver squeeze. And maybe, just maybe, this is why you had these four big cartel bullion banks who are notoriously known to be short coming over with hat in hand in the Shanghai Metals Exchange four weeks in a row. Maybe that's what this is talking about. The bottom line is, to me, silver represents um, the, the, the best most undervalued opportunity asset I've ever seen. I want to throw one other piece at you. And then uh, I know this, we're getting late in the tooth here, but you know, going back to Vancouver two years ago. So I've seen you there each year. And two years ago, I gave a speech. And in it, I said that there's 500 ounces of silver in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. And you know, it's interesting when you look at the Silver Institute numbers, which show a deficit, a structural deficit, over 200 million ounces the last few years in a row, omits any military application. And we're, we're led to believe that it is a little bit of, of, of physical monetary demand from, the, from the, the, the people who are buying physical silver, but mostly it's industrial in, in solar panels and electronics and green applications. John Little, of, of um, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Pickaxe has done an amazing job in talking about the military industrials complex role in all of this. Now, when I gave that speech two years ago, a man came up to me in the audience after, and he said, you know, I, I, I'm a consultant for the Department of Defense, and I actually helped design the Patriot missile. He said, I'm not sure how much, but I do believe there is some silver in it. I'll get back to you. Never heard from him. Last year when I'm there, I give another speech. At the end, he comes up to me, shakes my hand. You remember me? I'm Bob. I'm the guy I talked with you. I'm the DOD consultant. He had a stack of pictures in his hand this big. He says, um, what I'm showing you, Andy, is all um, declassified, so it's okay. And he shows me how they were launching the Patriot missile, the testing it off a platform off the coast of California and, and how he had problems launching it vertically because it usually came out of submarines and this and that. I said, by the way, you're right. I did some checking. There's between 13 and 14 kilograms of silver in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. Now, think about this for a second, Kai, and think about why these banks would be massively short in silver the way they are, more than any commodity traded on COMEX. Why they would be as stupid as a mud wall to do this in this environment where the dollar, the treasury, all of these things are being questioned and, and shed in favor of commodities. Sultan Pozar, Bretton Woods Three commodities, Ask yourself, why would Western commercial banks be short silver the way they are when all of the wars that are being fought around the globe and all of the high-tech weaponry and missiles and, and aerospace that needs copious amounts of silver that the Silver Institute does not mention at all in their supply-demand fundamentals? And you, you wonder, is there a fine line between conspiracy and reality? But I will simply say this to you. In my heart of hearts, I don't think I've, I, I've ever seen an asset that is depleting in nature, coming out of the ground, according to Keith Newmeyer, at seven to one right now, yet being priced at 78 to one. It's come down a bit from where it was. An asset that is massively used, has duality in, in demand, in green, in digital, in monetary, in military. An asset that is, is, is disappearing in nature, increasing in demand, and yet the price ratio, God's ratio right now is seven to one. It was 16 to one for 5,000 years. Keith Newmeyer says, well, because it's found in nature, like your skin is epidermis, because it's found in nature in a form called epithermal, right near the top, the big deposits were gone forever ago. So most of the silver that is mined comes as a 
byproduct of mining other things like copper or tin or gold. Hey, we found some silver. It's disappearing in nature. It's increasing in demand. The Silver Institute isn't telling us the truth. The amount of rehypothecation on the COMEX and the LBMA, the price setting mechanisms for the world is off the freaking charts. And so the real value of silver is not known. The price discovery has never been allowed to be hap to happen, but yet India imports 600 million ounces, probably more. And China is buying it off the hook, probably more than we know. And now the, the banks who are naked short show up at, at, at the LBMA, I mean, at the Shanghai Metals Exchange because the, the stockpiles in the West have dwindled to next to nothing. And all of a sudden they start to fall too. Could this all be related? I don't know, man. Put the pieces together. I will tell you, I don't think I've ever seen a better opportunity than, than silver. And I mean that as God is my witness. I really do mean that. Well, one name that keeps popping up is always JP Morgan. And we're going to talk about that. We got to save some bullets here for our meeting in, in uh, Boca here very shortly. Uh, Andy, I, I tremendously appreciate your time. Like it was a phenomenal conversation. We're going to do a bit of a follow up. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Andy, actually, as a follow up to this discussion, I'll be seeing him in about what is it now? Four weeks down in down in Florida at the Rick Rule Symposium. Um, so, leave those comments down below. Leave the questions down below. I'll ask Andy those questions, and we'll get to those. Maybe we'll do a bit of a Q and A there in uh, in Boca. Andy, yeah, do a bit of a different man. format. Why not? Awesome. And I'd be awesome, uh, really, dude. I'd love really to appreciate that. your time. Phenomenal insights. Uh, I've looked up the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Like they announce every bank visiting on their websites. Yeah, fantastic to track. It was Standard Charter. It was the last one, by the way, you were missing. So I um, forgot Standard Charter. My bad. Yeah, they were the fourth <laughs> one. And but yeah, they're they're very short silver too. Ironically, so there you go. Absolutely fantastic, Andy. Where can we find more of your work? MousFranklin.com. Yeah, and, and YouTube, anyone obviously. that's interested in in we keep our our really, really competitive price list, list offline. Uh, send us an email at info at Miles Franklin. You can ask for that, uh, info at milesfranklin.com, or you can, any questions you heard here, any any comments from me, please let me know. Kai, you're one of my favorites in this industry. I have been since the day I met you. You're a class act. I appreciate being able to come here and, and chat with you. It's always great, and look forward to having a beer with you and chatting in person uh, in uh, in Boca here in my backyard here in, in just a few weeks. Oh, looking forward to it tremendously. Taste, taste the beer sounds phenomenal right now. So, Andy, Likewise. thank you so much. Everybody else, you heard it earlier. Please leave a question for Andy down below. We will be doing a follow-up in about four weeks with him in Boca. Might as well make it a Q&A session. So put your questions down below. I'll print them out. I'll bring them to the meeting, and we'll record those. So thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, <laughs> reaching a wider audience. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on SOAR Financially.